I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. Good day, everyone. My name is Erica, and on behalf of Kerasoft Technology, I would like to welcome you to our webinar, Public Utilities Commission Docket Management Solution. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter of the day, Dina Tierney. Thank you, Erica. Hello, my name is Dina Tierney. I'm the CEO of Pacific Point, and I will be the moderator for our webinar today featuring the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Uh, Pacific Point had the great pleasure of working with the Hawaii PUC as the Salesforce implementation partner for their docket management solution, which went live in June of 2023. Uh, before I introduce our special guests from the Hawaii PUC I'll sh and share more about their um, really impactful solution, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, and I really do appreciate you taking 45 minutes out of your day to listen in, and we hope that you find today's webinar valuable. To give you an idea of what we have planned today, I will kick things off and share a little bit about Pacific Point, who we are um, as a company, what we do, and our role with the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Then we'll talk about the background of the Hawaii PUC docket management project, discussing its goals and objectives. And then lastly, we'll transition to an overview of the project itself, including wrapping up with some insights on the business impact that Hawaii has gained since going live. Um, but don't worry, we've also reserved, um, like Erica said, about 10 minutes or so at the end of today's webinar for you to ask questions um, to me and our guests. Um, and, and like Erica said, if you do have questions along the way, uh, it's totally fine to go ahead and just add them in advance into the chat or wait till the Q&A time. Either way is totally fine because um, Erica will be watching that for us. All right. So first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Pacific Point. Uh, we are a full service Salesforce consulting firm, which it is really all we do as a consulting company. We've, we've, we've really focused on Salesforce, but in addition, we've also focused on public sector in particular. While we do work in a few other industries um, in, in a broad sense, the majority of the work that Pacific Point does is for the public sector. Um, you can see on the slide that we've been around since 2011, so we're 13 years old. We are headquartered in Honolulu, Hawaii, but we do have locations throughout the U.S. in California, Oregon, Colorado, Texas, and we also have um, an Asia-Pacific Asia or APAC region-based set of offices in Australia and Singapore. You can see here there's an app exchange rating, and what that means is Salesforce allows us the opportunity to have a listing and allow our customers to put ratings um, as it relates to the services that we offer. And we're really thankful uh, for our five-star rating um, that our customers have given us. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see ca capacity and competencies. Uh, we do have over 240 certifications. Those are Salesforce-specific certifications across our 40, uh, over 40 consultants um, that work at Pacific Point. Um, in terms of the services that we offer, we do um, really those full service implementations that include implementation and redesigns or upgrades or kind of those um, health check type solutions that we implement for our customers who've had Salesforce for a number of years. But also we do legacy system migrations for those implementations that are first time but actually moving off of an older system onto a new. And we provide ongoing managed services. Um, listed here, some of our federal <clears throat> socioeconomic designations and also key partnerships, uh, key partnerships with AWS and DocuSign actually come into play as it relates to this project with the Hawaii PUC. Um, in addition, our services related to implementation, legacy system migration, and ongoing services played a role with the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, as well as, as other customers too. Um, on this slide, um, just gives you an overview. Like I said, we do a number of industries, but most, most of our focus is on the public sector, and we have extensive implementation experience across a range of different state agencies and use cases, um, as well as Salesforce products themselves. So this slide gives you a summary of some of those experiences, and I bolded in blue the particular ones that came into play uh, as it related to this particular project um, with the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Um, so, you know, Public Utilities Commission, we've done a lot in the regulatory agency area. And then I highlighted in blue some other um, experiences that, um, again, we have that were particularly relevant to today's conversation. So with that, um, let's shift gears 
and get you introduced to our guest speakers from the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Uh, let's say hello to them. I think they're going to come online and, and um, wave at you, I think, <laughs> in a minute. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll kind of introduce each one. I think, first of all, we have Jody and Ochai. Uh, she is the State of Hawaii Public Utilities Commission's Executive Officer. She's responsible for overseeing the PUC's operations, administrative and organizational management, and strategic planning. And Jody spent several years, more than 22 years, at the Hawaii Government Employees, Employees Association, which is the state's largest labor union, beginning her career there as a communi in communications, advancing to senior advisor, and spent her final years there as the deputy executive director. But now in her role at the Hawaii PUC as um, the executive officer, she really was instrumental in this project and served as our executive sponsor for the project along with the chair of the PUC. So uh, thank you, Jody, for being here. <laughs> All right, and then next up we have Deborah Kwan. She is the Communications Officer for the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, and she handles media relations and oversees the Commission's public information and communications programs. And she has over 15 years of communications experience at the federal and state levels of government, including service with the um, U.S. Senator Daniel K. Inouye, Hawaii State Majority, uh, Senate Majority Caucus, State of Hawaii Department of Taxation, and the U.S. Air Force. Um, and Deborah was instrumental in leading external communications as it related to this particular project. So thank you, Deborah, for being here. <laughs> nice to see you. And last but definitely not least, um, we have David Takashima. Uh, he's the Information Technology Section Manager for the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission with over 25 years of IT experience um, with the state of Hawaii working at the Office of Elections, Office of Enterprise Technology Services, and the last 14 years at the Hawaii PUC. And I have to say, Dave was, um, uh, you know, a savior in all of this. He is definitely, he was our IT lead, subject matter expert for the project. Uh, by the way, it goes by Dave. So if I call him Dave, it's, it's legit. But he, we've, we talked over and over uh, with our team and Dave is, was um, just an incredible knowledge to me across this particular project. And, and honestly, I appreciate all of you being here, but these projects, as as all of you know, that are in our are in our audience, they're not possible without ex outstanding leadership and commitment on the client side. And the Hawaii PUC was a great example of what it takes to get a project like this done. So, anyways, thank you for being here, Jody, Deborah, and Dave. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Now, uh, thank you. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions uh, for our panelists today, but let's take a step back first and uh, talk about the why and where it all began. So I've got a slide up. I'll kind of review it quickly, and then I've got a couple questions for Jody and Deborah in a minute, um, but I'll tee things up. So first of all, um, as you can see on the slide, the mission for the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission is to ensure Hawaii's public utility consumers have access to essential utilities and services that are delivered in a safe, in safe reliable, and resilient ways. And um, this slide shows some challenges that the PUC faced, but it also speaks to opportunities to improve and innovate. And a lot of the content that you see on this slide has actually come straight off of the RFP and a lot of work that I know the PUC did, PUC did well before even the RFP dropped. And, you know, just looking at some of these items, I don't necessarily need to read them all, but I encourage you to look through them. You know, cumbersome challenges on this challenges side, cumbersome and frustrating search, um, limited online um, services, a disparate technology, limited automation, um, tools that aren't adaptive, um, and not being able to uh, provide real-time reporting or have that internal visibility. But on the flip side, there were some really powerful opportunities that the Public Utilities Commission was seeking to improve that public service and satisfaction, get more of those e-services and self-services capable uh, online, um, real-time filing access and, and consolidating the solutions, uh, re reduction of errors, being able to gain those efficiencies internally, store their documents, including those that are confidential, and then the reporting and search. I'm sure many of you in our audience can relate to some of those. So before I ask my questions of Jody, I did want to put ask Erica if she can do me a favor real fast. 
Um, and uh, there's a poll question that should come up in a minute for those of you that are in our audience to see which of these opportunities resonate with you too. Because again, this came from Hawaii's Public Utilities Commission, but maybe um, some of these are for you as well. So these should pop up on your screen. Um, you can pick um, your top three. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so while you guys are doing your polling, I do have some questions for Jody and Deborah. Um, so Jody, can you share a bit more um, with our audience about the background for the project? How did it come to be? What was the driver for change? Uh, what are those key business goals that you're looking for at the executive level? Right, well, aloha everyone. Um, so I joined the PUC uh, at, in 2019 and already at that point, a feasibility study had been done. And the, the catalyst for that was a um, state auditor's report in uh, February 2018. It was a pretty scathing report, and I just want to read, um, you know, it, the overview of what how the state auditor described the system, the document management system at the time. He said it was difficult to use, unreliable, slow, and obsolete, with staff developing elaborate workarounds to accommodate for the system's shortcomings, and so. Um, you know, taking that, um, the recommendations from the state auditor that led the team um, to uh, look into, uh, you know, what would be the best solution. And uh, from the feasibility study, uh, it was a single vendor replacement um, was determined to be the best path forward. Uh, in 2020, we posted the RFP. And in 2021, the uh, Pacific Point was selected. And the project started a few months later in July. Um, and as Dina mentioned earlier, uh, we launched, um, we had a go live in, in June, 2023. And essentially the, you know, the main business goal was to create a modern user-friendly system for both internal and external customers. Um, you know, you can see the features there, uh, searchable text was really important, um, electronic filing, payments online, uh, and, just um, to let you folks know, I guess, how how critical the case and document management system uh, is into most of our employees, um, I would say nearly everyone, <laughs> every employee's day, daily work. Uh, we had our very first strategic planning session in early 2020, and organically what came out of that, uh, one of the goals really centered around um, this modernization of the system. And even when we did, we recently completed our um, strategic planning update of the plan, uh, it still remains uh, as one of the three goals uh, to have the IT and CDMS enhancements. So um, we continue to, to move forward and um, yeah, so I think yeah. that was it. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jody. And I think you bring up a good point right there at the end. Well, first of all, amazing history uh, to drive you to this point, to drive the point PC to this point. But I think you bring up a good point at the end that any technology project, when you implement it, it's sort of not the end. You know, it's it continues to evolve. It continues to grow with you. And the, the key was finding a solution that allowed you to be more adaptive and adjust um, as those, those continued evolution of your technology and your processes continue to change. Um, so I, it's it's a great to hear, and I think um, makes a ton of sense that it continues to be a key part of your strategic vision mm -hmm. and planning. I um, want to turn to Deborah real fast. Um, as the communications officer, from your perspective, can you talk more um, in more detail about what you're looking to accomplish, you were looking to accomplish as it relates to public communications, anything in particular? So our old system was implemented in 2008. Uh, so it was kind of, it was at the time it was um, new and, and by the time we replaced it, it's, it's over 10 years old. And so we're looking for something a little bit more modern that people really expect from modern websites and what they can do online, which was expanded significantly over that over that course of a decade. So we want to make sure that the users felt like that our website was in line with their expectations of what you should be able to do with government and catching up with uh, a lot of other different kinds of agencies that have these kinds of self-service. We want to make sure 
that people were able to be self-service. Um, and that would actually help us reduce the amount of calls and emails and inquiries that we get and really focus our public engagement on things like outreach instead. Whereas if we could get them to really focus on being able to make easier payments by themselves, easier filing, um, being able to search in a in a more natural way, like how you would use a Google search instead of using the old style searching where you have to have very strict um, program parameters where you have to use like things like the and or keys and, and, and asterisks when you're searching and be able to track what they're doing. So it was really a way that as the as energy for us, uh, which is 95% of our work really, as those topics became more um, hot and, and top of mind and people are more conscious of their own use of their own energy, their own sustainability, they became very interested in what we're doing at the Public Utilities Commission and the kind of uh, limelight that we're receiving. We want to make sure that we had a system that was going to be able to get people the information they needed and be able to continue learning about us and be able to file with us um, in, in a way that really meets our expectations. Um, thank you, Deborah. I, I, that's an excellent point. You're right. Consumers have certain expectations and um, it's tough to sometimes keep, keep up with them for sure. And we will talk a little bit later about uh, some of the business gains achieved for the PUC. Uh, but before we do, let's dive into the project itself a little bit. Um, so what you see on this slide is an overview of the case and docket management system. There's, a, there's several key components here. I'm going to ask Dave to give us some information about these. But before you do, if you can draw your eyes to some of these numbers on here, the first one being number one uh, for that docket management where the filings and cases are, that's kind of the foundation for the solution. It's where your key data is. Uh, number two on the left, that's document management. So that's that integrated document repository where your files are now connected in with those records. And then number three, um, that's the public board portal, you know, where it's, it, again, all connected, all together uh, with an integrated portal. And up on the upper right, number four, um, which is credit card and ECH payments, uh, both online and in person. So with these four areas as kind of the main, you know, bolts of the system, Dave, I'm wondering if you can speak to each of these components, maybe give us a bit of context in terms of what was there before, maybe um, add some color there, you know, what was there before, what do you have now? Um, and yeah, I'm interested to hear from you on that. Thank you, Dina. Um, so uh, prior to our CDMS system, our what was our old docker management system, our DMS system, um, it was built on uh, IBM Content Navigator and uh, it was highly customized. So any kind of changes we need to do the system, we always had to go back to our developer and had a lot of need to work closely with our developer. And our DMS handled our, our docket management and, and our document management. So any, anything related to our docket cases. Our non-docket cases were all stored in disparate systems. It could be either on our on-premise file server, or it could be tracked on access databases. So an example would be our annual, uh, annual financial report and PUCPs was um, managed in an uh, access database that was developed in-house, I think back in the no, early 2000s or 1990s. Um, and as far as like our document management, we had our docketed documents in the DMS system and our non-docket documents were all on our on-premise on file servers and eventually migrated online through Teams. But, you know, it was two separate locations that we had our documents. For our public portal, we had our, our electronic services all in our DMS, but it was only limited basically to our docket processes. All our non-docketed processes were all done uh, either uh, manually or through, basically manually it would be all the filings we can be submitted in manually. Um, and we also had to kind of integrate it with our main website, our WordPress website. So there were a lot of um, manual integrations we had to set up on a WordPress website to, to direct traffic back and forth. 
And then the final component, the credit card, the ACH payments. So prior to this, uh, we only accepted ACH or e-checks online. And it was, uh, and we, and, and we saw throughout time that the need for us to expand to uh, allow for credit card purchases. And it was our previous chair and I think Jody's big push to have that. So that was a big change to our system. Um, yeah, it's a good overview. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, so now when you look at this slide, I just think um, what are some of your favorite capabilities of the newer system now that you, you know, maybe don't have all the pieces or you have a sort of a different setup because uh, I know you had to support those those systems in the past. Uh, what are some of your favorite capabilities now? From an IT perspective, it's definitely consolidating all our systems, you know, and modernizing the system. So, you know, by being a more modernized and um, web completely web based system, made it a lot more flexible and easier for us to uh, continue development. That Joey was kind of speaking, how we continually to adjust our our system and our processes and um, not having our staff have to know what systems to jump to, how to search for different documents. I think just getting everything consolidated into one system and going through the exercise of doing that. So having all our staff learn, you know, tell us what their processes was to get that into one place. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Dave, for that. And before we move on, maybe Eric, if you wanted to pop up the results of the poll just for people to take a look at, and we'll we'll switch to our next slide and continue this conversation. <laughs> okay, nice. So e-filing is pretty high up there and documents. Yeah, well, actually, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of favorites here. Thank you for participating in this. Um, next up is the um, project itself. I kind of wanted to dive a little bit further. And I think those of us that are in the public sector, we know there's a lot of legacy systems um, around and, um, or like Dave was explaining, you know, things that get kind of added on and then they become the real thing. They become the thing that everyone relies on for many years. Um, and so leveraging the, the Salesforce as the basis for this solution really helps set the stage for that more adaptable solution um, and then to Jody's point, you know, that continuous improvement, that idea that now with this new platform, it, it doesn't stop, it continues. But these are not easy tasks. And you can use, and if, as you can see from this slide, you know, um, a bit of a summary, an 18 year old system um, for both internal and external staff consolidating, you know, over 10 legacy applications into a single consolidated or integrated solution went live in June 23, like we talked about. Uh, migrated over 600,000 records from the legacy systems and over 250 files. Um, on that file migration tab, you can see uh, OCR, 250 of those 250,000 files and set up ongoing OCR. So OCR is optical character recognition, and it allows for that searching that Deborah was talking about too, that more flexible search to just kind of put in a word that the public might be looking for, those that are looking at energy and sustainability on the public side might be might be wanting to do that kind of open search. So now they can search through those files because they've been um, OCR'd. Um, and then on the, on the um, other side of this, we have the Salesforce piece for the docket and case management, um, also DocuSign CLM for document management and Chargent was used um, related to um, the payment gateway integration that was used um, based on what Dave was saying for credit card and, and ACH. Um, so, you know, looking at this slide, this was a lot to accomplish, but I think there's another dynamic to not only this being a very impressive set of work that the team at the Hawaii PUC worked, worked together with us on, but Jody, you know, this project was initiated during the pandemic. Um, can you talk about that experience and, you know, what were the challenges? How did you overcome those obstacles? Love to hear from you. Yeah, um, you know, if if we were to think back to what life was like at that time, um, being able to complete this project, I mean, it's quite amazing. Uh, when we, we all, our entire office shut down and every single employee was re uh, working remotely. And again, this was a time, I think we, you know, all, many of us were adjusting to meeting virtually, like today it's become very comfortable. 
Um, but at a time when we're needing employees input for this project, right? Um, being able to, you know, how do you engage employees <laughs> when they're, you know, during a time that they're adjusting to the virtual setting? Uh, I think that was really challenging. And for the, the team who was in charge of the project in doing the different um, sprints and, and sessions, it was, you know, needing to consider what would be the best way to obtain the, the feedback that we need. Um, initially, there were a lot of long sessions and the work involved is very detailed. So again, you know, it's virtual, it's already challenging to keep people engaged, um, but you're going into the weeds on a lot of things. Uh, and just noticing that, um, you know, paying attention to the level of, of um, you know, input and comments and, you know, the team really wasn't quite getting what they needed. So looking to different ways to obtain that input um, was necessary. So, um, you know, whether it was having small groups or, um, you know, having people, because not everyone is um, comfortable even sharing in front of, you know, 20 of their coworkers. So, you know, offline, are there ways that they could be able to, you know, um, provide written uh, input for about the, you know, the parts of the systems that we were going through? Um, so yeah, it was, it was challenging. It's like a different time <laughs> thinking back then. Um, but we, we did it. And I think it's, it's quite a huge accomplishment. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and then Dave, when you look at this slide and see all the files and you see the migration effort, not only files, but even just functionality, a lot of functionality in these applications, um, just for our audience, you know, what would you say was the biggest technical challenge or maybe something that surprised you that you'd let you'd want to let other PCs be prepared for? Uh, so I guess so honestly, the the hardest technical problem was also kind of tied to uh, procurement for us being from state government. The most what ended up being the most difficult procurement, more difficult than RFP itself, was procuring our online pay, online payment processing services. Being a state agency and and having to follow the state laws is, you know, as far as creating accounts and uh, signing uh, indemnity clauses within contracts with different companies, made it very difficult for us to not be on our own and. Uh, actually delayed our project several months that we hadn't accounted for. So to me is along with setting up your system and knowing what your process would be is also making sure if you have an online uh, payment processing plan that you're ready to do that and you know the rules for your, your government. And I think maybe the other thing was kind of the change management for our staff that as Jody was saying that not only was, you know, we, you know, change management alone for any, to any new system is going to be different, difficult. And like George was saying, through the pandemic, it made it even more difficult where Pacific Point couldn't sit down with our staff, you know, couldn't look over the shoulder and see what they were doing. So as far as, you know, building out the system and um, learning what our processes were, I think that and, and, transi and transitioning to production, those that was another big issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, they're definitely not easy tasks, and I think anyone looking at this like can tell that you know there's a lot of work and dedication that went to it, and your advice is helpful. Um, but let's shift gears a little bit and take, take a, a look at some statistics now that the system has been live for over a year. Um, and this first one is really aimed at self-service. So I'll explain each one of these quickly, just in the interest of time. Um, and then Jody, Deborah, Dave, you know, if there's any additional stuff you'd like to share on these, please feel free. Um, but that first stat on the far left-hand side shows you that 50%, again, this is starting from go live to about a week or so ago, 50% um, of the PUC filings that have been filed um, as a whole have been made through the public portal. 
So what I'm seeing here, and I think what we're all seeing is is, is great self-service capabilities um, that, um, you know, are, are a great representation of the public's engagement. Um, and then diving in a little bit further into that middle statistic, out of those filings, those PUC filings that have been made through the portal, 45% or nearly half of them are filings that are considered what the PC Hawaii calls non-docketed. And why this is significant is these filing types were not previously available in the legacy portal. So you're seeing that not only are people using the system, and yes, they did have some portal capabilities before, but you're seeing a whole new world of filing types that previously wasn't accessible that represents almost half of those e-filings. Um, the third statistic on the side is the 52% of the, the payments that have been collected have been received online. So again, we're just showing self-service. There, there was some um, online payment capability through ACH, like Dave had said. But when we dive deeper into this statistic, we can see that 55% of those online payments were credit card. And to Dave's point, like in the past, um, they knew that they needed to offer, you know, there was a, a recognition that maybe maybe people want to pay by credit card too. So in the past, that wasn't available. So um, I think this is a good view into the self-service engagement that's happening now. Um, Jody, Deborah, Dave, is there anything extra you wanted to add um, to provide additional color? All good? <laughs> okay. That's, oh, that's I, I can ask all okay. so was, okay. for, for your first chart there as far as the uh, in-person filings. So I think one thing when we went live, we wanted to to have the uh, credit card payment on premise so that when filers were coming, they could do it. And what we found is it's not being used at all because basically the volume of people walking in the front door has dropped. So I, I think that's a good sign of uh, the adoption of our online system. That's a good point. Yeah, thank you, Dave, appreciate that. Um, so on the no, um, oh, not talking to filings. So in the past, because they were not readily available for, long, for people to search them, uh, we didn't see as much of it. So we're seeing a significant increase in the amount of information that we can get out to people about uh, things like annual financial reports or even um, just things that we used to keep in filings that we wanted to make public that were, that were not actually docketed. We would throw them into a single folder for the whole year and we're actually able to make separate case types for that. So like really parcel them out and give them um, so, so that there's really a, more of a repository that's by that's by subject area rather than just all lumped in together. So that's been that's been a huge um, increase in transparency for us. Awesome, thank you, Deborah. Um, all right, well, I'll move on to the next slide, which is a, is related to public engagement. Um, so we got a couple stats here. Uh, first one on the on the left is that seventy three percent of the informal complaints. Um, have been submitted through the portal. And that, that functionality was previously not available for informal complaints to be available to the public through the site. Um, but to see that kind of public engagement um, is good. And then, and then that kind of longer graph that you see on the right is showing that over 4,000 public portal um, notification subscriptions, if you will, have taken place since go live for uh, and what this means is that the public can go onto the, the PUC's um, CDMS website and subscribe to be notified about reports, PUC reports and or cases. And you can see there was like this big um, influx at the beginning. And I think that was thanks to Jody and Deborah and Dave for really broadcasting out to the public that this feature functionality was available. So there's high engagement, but you can see every month after that, there's been continual subscriptions, new people engaging with the site to be notified about PUC reports and, and cases. So again, um, Jody, Deborah, Dave, is there anything other context uh, to help uh, on these two slides, uh, sorry, on these two graphs that you wanted to mention? Deborah, anything to say as it relates to PUC's strategic plan related to public engagement? Yeah, so what I can say is that uh, there there was a really changing expectation that people could engage with us easier, especially with our consumers. So our regulated utilities have always uh, engaged with us because they have to, and so they'll find ways to do it, and we want to make it easy for them. But for consumers, it's a little bit more difficult, and they really only come to us when they have problems, and that would be in the in the complaint process. 
So in the past, um, they would contact like an enforcement officer, they would give them a form where they could download a form online, they would fill it out. And moving that form to a fillable online form really reduced the num number of errors, made it easier to process um, pulling in. So we're able to kind of get a more complete picture of what that complaint um, process looks like. It's not available publicly, but this is really something that is a tool that we can use. Uh, this is something that I think we're still trying to see how we can get some good reporting out of it, but it, we are seeing that they are coming through the portal. So people are liking using this form rather than having to download a PDF, filling it out and writing what they need to do on it. Agree. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm just watching the clock. So I want to get through a couple more um, insights and then we'll open it up for some questions. Um, but, you know, we talked about self-service, public engagement, but there are also some really powerful wins for the staff themselves. Like Jody mentioned that being an important aspect of this project as well. And we've listed, there's a lot of words here and I'm not going to go through the whole bit. Um, this will be shared with you as well. But there are five things listed here with some really key capabilities that had a big impact for the public utility staff themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, public self-service, even though that's for the public, it actually played a very significant role for the internal staff to get filings processed quickly and accessible for the public. Um, Real-time visibility of information, that data validation to help reduce errors, not only for the public, but also internally to help validate certain data entry things. Uh, workload management is a big one. Um, so that there's uh, assignment of work out and standardized meetings or action or activities plans based on the case type to really help drive the activities and workload uh, management. And then that seamless event calendar where in the old days it used to be like when these events and these hearings changed, having to go to the website, but really in real time, all of this is happening together. Um, so I, I, Jody, I guess I wanted to ask you, can you shed any additional light on some examples of those internal wins, or maybe even speak to wins from the commissioner's perspective, if, if you have anything to share on, on this. Yes, of course. Um, it, you know, there's just a number of features that, um, I mean, kind of where, where do we begin? <laughs> I think um, in terms of um, managing our workload and being able to look at the data um, and, and gather that the data that we have in a reporting feature that's kind of top of mind, especially as we head toward the legislative session and um, they're needing certain performance metrics and um, things like that. And now with the system, we're um, able to be uh, be able to pull these reports rather than previously, you know, having to crunch the numbers manually. Um, you know, as we continue to adjust to the system as Dave was, was mentioning, um, you know, it does take time for, for staff to get used to uh, a lot of the features. And, but I think just overall, um, being able to um, take a look at, you know, where the dockets are, you know, who's working on what um, is something that for those who work specifically on the dockets, including um, the commissioners, right, needing to know the status of certain things. I think that's been um, a great help through their day-to-day um, -day work. Awesome. All right. Well, related to that first one, and, and I think tying in exactly to what you're talking about from the commissioners having that visibility, um, there's a statistic that we have here to show you. Just to give you an example, um, this is from Go Live from June to you know August timeframe, and it shows a variety of case types um, from intake that. Uh, a filing to the releasing of it to the public for public access on the portal. And this is shown in hours. And so you can see, um, you know, before to, to Jody's point, you know, these filings were, would be received, but they wouldn't be available for people within the PUC to see straight away until they had been reviewed and processed and publicly released. Um, and so this shows you now with the, the, that collection of, um, you know, portal activity, but also internal change management to Jody's point, you know, it started off taking more hours and now it's, it's, it's slowly becoming faster for the team to be able to do. Um, Jody, Dave, Deborah, Dave, anything else to add on this slide, just to kind of 
that provide any extra context. Well, well thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna, I know we're coming up and I wanted to make sure there was at least a few minutes left for questions. Um, but before we do, Jody, maybe you could kind of warm us up a little bit. Is there anything you wanna share about where the PUC goes from here? Um, yeah, any, any thoughts? Well, the work continues, right? It's, um, you know, like any uh, large uh, system replacement, as our staff uh, works with the new system, right, you discover there's little uh, areas to improve. And so we're going through that. Um, and we, you know, again, it's part of our strategic plan um, in looking at the enhancements to the system. And um, this time around, we want to make sure that um, we are very clear about um, you know, what it is that um, are the priority areas. And uh, we're right now, in fact, um, had sent out an internal survey to our staff asking about their experience using the system and any outstanding areas. And so um, we will be also um, obtaining data from our external users as well. Awesome, that's great. Um, so with that, Erica, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, and thank you so much to all of our speakers. This information has been very valuable for everyone in attendance. And I'm very excited to move into our Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A pod and we will do our best to answer them live. So we'll give you a minute or two now, um, but I believe that we already have some in there. So are you able to make configuration changes in-house now? Uh, yes, yes, we are. Um, we do have a maintenance contract with Pacific Point to help us with more difficult um, adjustments. But you know, a, a, a emphasis of our RFP was to have uh, a system that had more clicks than and less code. So things that we could go into the system and make changes. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And the next question, can you provide examples of what a non-docketed filing is? It's a double question. Would a public comment fall under that category for HPUC? I, I can kind of take some of this and maybe Deborah can fill in, but you know, so a, a docketed um, filing is something related to one of our docketed cases. And they basically, it's a specific type of case that has to follow uh, specific rules where the applicant will submit an application or some, something to initiate the case, and then it will end with an order, or this is an order on our side. So there are definite timelines related to it. So an example of a non-docket case would be something like our uh, all our regulated entities are required to file an annual financial report with us. Um, so that is a non-docket filing. Or if uh, we also regulate motor carriers, so if there's a citation against a motor carrier, that would be a non-docketed filing. Deborah, do you have anything to add? Yeah, that's that's a, um, our public comments. We consider them to be docketed filings because they submit them in, to to a docket. So we're actually working out our personal our internal business process on how we're going to handle public comments on non-docketed issues. But for now, the way we've, def how we've defined public comments have always been that they have to be filed on a docket that the commission is considering. And probably the, the biggest reason we kind of differentiate our docket and non-docket documents is that by rules where we are required to make our docket documents public and resolve the case in a certain amount of time. Thank you so much for that. Um, and David, I'm gonna pass this one to you as well. Um, can members of the public subscribe to be notified when a new case of a particular type is filed? Or do members of the public subscribe to existing cases to get notice of additional filings in those cases? Um, so, so both. So we have uh, a daily activity report that will list all the new applicants that come in. And from that, they can see when a new case would be a docketed case, or even a non-docketed case would come up. And at that point, the uh, uh, 
the filer could could follow that or subscribe to that case. And then anything filed into that case, they'll be sent an email to notify them. Okay, thank you so much for that. All right, and I believe that that is all we have time for um, for today. So thank you so much, everyone, again, um, for attending our event. Thank you to Pacific Point and to the Hawaii PUC for your insights today. I'd also like to thank all of our participants for joining us. We hope this information was helpful to you and your organization. Our contact information is displayed on the screen, so please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any further questions. Thank you so much and have a great day. This concludes today's webinar.